Before viewing video lessons, it is important to read the textbook using the learning guide as your turn-by-turn -turn directions. Then use the learning guide to take organized notes in your own words with examples and pictures. Chapter 3, Biological Bases of Behavior. <clears throat> From this point forward in the semester, we will be covering the biopsychosocial model of human behavior, going into the details regarding each piece and how it influences our behavior. In Chapter 3, the focus will be on biological aspects that influence human behavior. These include genetics, anatomy, and physiology. In particular, we will be focusing on the nervous system and the endocrine system. Recent research in psychology also shows that the immune system and the digestive system can also influence behavior, but this relationship is not well understood at this point. In this video, we will be covering part of communication in the nervous system. We're going to start by looking at the parts of the nervous system. <clears throat> the uh, way a neuron processes a signal both within the neuron and between the neurons and how neural networks are structured. The nervous system is made up of two different types of cells, the glial cells and the neurons. In this particular picture, the neuron is the yellow cell and different types of glial cells are represented by the red and the blue. Most of what we know about the glial cells is that their primary function seems to be to provide structural support and insulation to the neurons in the nervous system. However, newer research suggests that these cells do much more than this. And we're starting to understand that they also bring nutrients to the neurons and waste products away. And if they're not functioning properly, this could influence the nervous system and behavior. The neurons are responsible for sending and receiving information. They are the primary communicator, communicators in the nervous system. They're made up of several different parts. The first part we're going to talk about are the dendrites. In this picture here, they are the branch-like structures coming off of the cell body. These particular structures are primarily responsible for receiving information. If you think about a neuron kind of like a um, telephone, this would be the part that you would be talking into. <clears throat> the next part of the neuron we're going to talk about is the soma or cell body. That's the big part right here. And it contains all the same things as every other cell in the body. So it has a nucleus, it has the DNA, the mitochondria, the chromosomes, all those kinds of things. And um, it's the part that the dendrites are attached to and also the part that the axon is attached to. The axon is a long, thin biological fiber that comes off of the soma or cell body and its primary function is to transmit the information away. So to take the information away from the soma. The axon is kind of like a wire in the brain and the nervous system. And just like electrical wires that you may have in your house, we want to insulate that wire. And in the body, the insulation we use is fat. So the axon is coated in a fatty insulation called myelin 
or the myelin sheath. The fatter this insulation is, the faster the axon can send signals. At the end of the axon is a structure called a terminal button. So there's terminal buttons here, very close to this next cell here. These terminal buttons are responsible for secreting the neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are chemical messengers. So it's a chemical that's used to send a message. Now between one neuron and another is an empty space. And this empty space, which is filled with fluid, is called a synapse. So in the picture, it looks like the neurons are physically touching each other. But what we know is that they're not actually touching. There's a small gap between one neuron and another, one cell and another. And that small gap is called the synapse. We also know that the cells are surrounded by fluid. In this case, it's going to be kind of a salty fluid where we have a lot of salt water in our body. So between the neurons is this salty water. Now that you know the different parts of the neuron, we want to talk about how these neurons can send and receive signals. There's two different processes at work. Within the cell and between the cells. Within the cell, there are electrochemical changes that cause a neural impulse. We're going to go into the details of those in just a minute. Between cells, so from one neuron to another neuron, signals are sent and received via neurotransmitters, those chemicals that travel across the synapse. So we're going to start with how a neuron receives a signal. So a neuron will receive a signal from other cells. Sometimes it's a neuron cell, sometimes it might be a skin cell sensing a temperature change, but they're going to receive neurons. We call receive neurotransmitters. We call the receiving neuron the postsynaptic neuron. It's the neuron that is receiving on the other side of the synapse. What happens on that particular neuron is on the surface of its dendrite are little receptor sites. These receptor sites are kind of like little locks. The neurotransmitters cross the synapse and they actually bind to these receptor sites. They lock in and trigger a change in the cell. So once that happens, we have a change within the neuron that results in the neural impulse. What we're going to actually do inside the neuron is create electricity using chemicals. So once the neurotransmitter binds to the dendrite, that's going to cause the cell membrane of that receiving or postsynaptic neuron to open up for just a minute. So as you probably know from other classes where you've studied cells, some cell membranes allow certain things to pass through. Well, in this case, when the neuron is resting, it's not getting a signal, its cell wall is closed, and the salts in the salty water around the cell, they kind of stay outside. So here we have some sodium right there. And so what happens when the neurotransmitter binds is it allows positively charged ions like sodium from outside the cell to flow in so they're flowing in to the interior of the cell. So what's going to happen in order to chemically create this electronic impulse 
is when the cell is at rest, the chemicals inside it overall have an electrical charge of negative 70 millivolts. Once you get enough sodium to cross in, sodium has a positive charge, there's actually a shift of electrical charge inside the neuron from negative to positive. This creates within the cell an electrical spark. That electrical spark then travels down along the axon. Once a neuron has fired this neural impulse or action potential, then it has to take a second to reset itself back to its normal negative charge. So it has to flush the sodium out, reset its chemical makeup inside the cell. And the time it takes it to reset is very, very short, typically one to two milliseconds. So this electrical impulse sparks and travels along the axon. And what it's going to do is it's going to reach the end of the axon where the terminal buttons are located. So the electrical impulse travels down the axon. Remember the axon is insulated in some fat which helps to speed that signal up. When it gets to the end of the axon in the terminal button there are sacs called synaptic vesicles that are filled with those chemical messengers, the neurotransmitters. When the electrical impulse reaches the end it triggers these chemicals to spill out into the empty space. Those chemicals, once they spill out into that fluid-filled space between the cells called the synapse, are going to diffuse. They're going to spread out and they're, some of them are going to go to touch the surface of the next neuron's dendrite. So the neuron that's sending the signal the presynaptic neuron will release those neurotransmitters which will then touch the surface of the receiving dendrite, the postsynaptic dendrite, bind on to those sites and the whole process will start over again. Now we call this voltage change that occurs the postsynaptic potential. <clears throat> So the voltage change that's triggered by the neurotransmitters binding at the receptive si receptor sites can actually be two different types of change. One type of change is an excitatory postsynaptic potential. This is the one that I've just described where you have a pos positive voltage shift inside the cell and the neuron fires the electrical impulse and the signal is sent. You can also have an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. In this case, the neuron does not fire. So some neurotransmitters are activating. They cause the neuron to fire. Some neurotransmitters um, reduce the likelihood that the neuron will fire. One more thing we have to talk about with this process <clears throat> is what happens to those neurotransmitters after they've sent the signal. So the neurotransmitter has bound to this receptor site. After it binds, unlocks the lock, the chemical is then released back up into the synapse. It's kind of taken out of the lock and it floats away again. Two things can happen at this point. One thing is that that neurotransmitter can be sucked back up through a process called reuptake and essentially recycled, put back in a synaptic vesicle to be used again later. So reuptake is one option, but some of those are going to get a little bit too far away for this particular terminal button to suck them back up. When that happens, enzymes in the nervous system will come in and break the neurotransmitter down where it can no longer activate.